And now, here's physician and veterinarian Dr. Joel Wallach with his Deadly Recipes lecture for your good health. Our goal, of course, is to have everybody die after 120. I don't care if it's 150 or 200, whatever it is. We have the capacity, we have the knowledge to get you well beyond 100, no doubt about it. Everybody, when they die past 120, should only have two pieces of paper in your health chart, a birth certificate and a death certificate. If you have a four-inch thick health chart full of all these surgeries and all these diseases, your doctor has failed you, the system has failed you. And we want to be known as the Home Depot of health. We want people, when they think of health, well, I'm not going to run to the doctor. I, I, I can do this myself. Just like when you're going to uh, lay tile in your house. Does everybody call a contractor now? No, they say, I'm going to run to Home Depot and price some tile there. And so we have the capacity. Just quickly, the interesting thing of this, which is a September 2000 issue of Scientific American cover article, almost the entire issue is devoted to human aging and 100-year-olds. There were lectures by different doctors. There were lectures by nurses or articles by doctors and nurses. There were articles by nutritionists and dietitians, uh, geneticists, gerontologists. And they all had different agendas on how to live past 100, but there was a common thread amongst all their articles. And the common thread was that everybody who lived to be 100 were mean, feisty, rebellious patients who did not listen to their doctor's instructions. They couldn't figure it out. The people who listened to their doctor's instructions to the letter didn't make it. They had these four-inch thick health charts, the ones who listened to their doctors. And you're going to find out why in just a second. Again, all the experts in genetics and gerontology tell us that we have the capacity very clearly to live to be 100. It's not like it's a um, secret. Everybody agrees on that. It's not a mystery. It's not a fable we're coming up with that you can live to be well beyond 100. People do it all the time. How many, raise your hand, have you ever made a dish from a recipe, a cookbook, a magazine, card collection? I mean, we've all done that. I mean, us guys, you know, they don't raise their hands, but yeah, they love to cook, make pancakes, make Pillsbury Doughboy muffins, you know. And the reason why they put pictures in cookbooks and things like that is so that you know where you're going. If I follow this recipe directly and I use the flour they recommend, I use the type of sugar they recommend, and use the right type of chardonnay they recommend, my fruit case can look like that. My asparagus lemon dish can look like that. My cranberry stuffed pork loin roast is going to look like that. Okay, that's why they put the pictures there. The same thing is true when it comes to health care. We've been using the same recipe, if you will, for health care in the industrialized nations for over 300 years. And so we can predict what the recipe outcome is going to be. We can predict that already. We know what a 25-year-old looks like. We know what a 50-year-old looks like. We know what a 75-year-old looks like and a 100-year-old and so forth. And so you can kind of look down the line. If you follow your doctor's instructions, you eat the way everybody's eating, you know what you're going to look like. Well, this is a pretty typical 85-year-old American. You're in a nursing home. You have Alzheimer's disease. You have macular degeneration. You've had cataract operations. You're deaf. Your teeth are gone because you had periodontal disease, which is osteoporosis of the face and jaw. Your thyroid has been removed for many reasons, so you're on drugs. You've had your shoulders replaced. You've had carpal tunnel surgeries. You've had your finger joints replaced. You've had multiple back surgeries. You've had angiograms, angioplasty. Stints have been inserted in your coronary arteries. You've had quadruple bypass. You've had a heart transplant. You've had maybe one lobe or an entire lung removed for many different things, including lung cancer, which is the most common cause of cancer in both men and women, regardless if you smoke or not. 95% of the people who get lung cancer don't smoke, never did smoke. There's a lot of good church-going Christians that never smoke, never been in a room with anybody who smoked, got lung cancer. That's because they're frying the fish after church and inhaling all those free radicals coming out of that frying oil. And then you can have your stomach banded and bypassed to lose weight. Or maybe you had ulcers and had your stomach removed. You've had kidneys removed. You've had kidney stone operations. You've had gallbladders removed. You've had your colon removed for polyps and cancer. Women have had hysterectomy. Men have had their prostate gland removed. And by the way, the newest information on the PSA, how many of you heard of the PSA test, ladies and gentlemen, you know, for prostate activity? Since 1987 to now, when they actually done the survey, when they removed prostates because they thought it was cancerous by actual biopsy, only 2% were actually cancerous. 98% false alarm. 98% is a false alarm. No man, I shouldn't say that, but no man who's done everything right has ever died from prostate cancer. You can die at 80 and have prostate cancer, but the prostate cancer didn't kill you. Nobody should ever die of prostate cancer. They've had hip replacements, knee replacements, feet have been amputated because they had diabetes. They're on 25 different medications for lowering cholesterol, for dealing with blood pressure, for thyroid, for diabetes, and many a pain and so forth. And if you follow the doctor's instructions, this is where you're going. This is where you're going to wind up. I mean, I'm excited. This is the recipe I want. I'm going to follow this recipe. No, I'm not too excited about that one. Maybe we have to get rich to live a long time. Well, there's never been a billionaire who ever lived to be 100. Think about it. Now, if money were important to living to be 100, you'd think that billionaires 
would live to be 100. There's never been a single one. This is from Forbes magazine. They said the average lifespan for billionaires is 78. The youngest one to die was 58 years old. He was the richest man in the United States. He was the heir to the Walmart empire. His daddy, old Sam Walton, when he died, left his entire empire to this guy, and he died at 58. The richest man in America died at 58. You see, money didn't help him at all, did it? I know, it's intelligence. That's it. We've got to get more degrees in school. That'll do it. There's never been a Nobel Prize winner ever lived to be 100. Linus Pauling came close. The only guy who ever had two unshared Nobel Prizes, got to be smart, died of prostate cancer. You don't have to do that, right? Died of prostate cancer at 94. So there's never been a billionaire lived to be 100. There's never been a Nobel Prize winner lived to be 100. Ah, why didn't I think of it before? It's fitness. That's what it is. Everybody says doctors say fitness is good for you. you got to exercise. Don't worry about supplementing because you get everything you need from your food, but just exercise. With the exception of two black gentlemen from the old Negro Baseball League days in the 1920s and 30s, there's never been a professional athlete ever lived to be 100. Now, fitness is important. You'd think a significant number of professional athletes would be living to be 100 because not only are this thing, but they also have lots of money. So money and fitness combined doesn't save athletes. But I love this title. Heart attack claims another fitness guru. The average lifespan for professional athletes is 62. I want to go there. So what is it? What is it? How do people live to be 100? So we know it's not money. We know it's not intelligence. It's not fitness. So how do people live to be 100? Again, we can extrapolate information from animals. We've, uh, in the last 75 years, tripled the lifespans of animals. Pet animals, laboratory animals, farm animals. We've tripled the lifespans. Do we do that with wonder drugs? No. Do we do that with genetically engineered protein stem cells? Do we do that with heart transplants? No. We did it just by tinkering with the vitamins and minerals and the essential fatty acids and the amino acids in their little food. Human beings need 90 essential nutrients. You all know that. We need 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids. And fortunately for us, our food plants, our grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts can take carbon dioxide from the air, use the sun's energy, and a process known as photosynthesis to manufacture carbon compounds. A wood, cellulose, starch, sugar, vitamins, amino acids, fatty acids. Yeah, plants can do all that. But you'll notice that plants cannot manufacture minerals. Plants cannot manufacture minerals. And two-thirds of the 90 essential nutrients are minerals. That's why we like to focus on minerals. Because even a blind hog can get an acorn sometime, as my daddy used to say. Which means that even if you're eating a cheeseburger with lettuce and tomatoes and onions on it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can get some vitamins. You're going to get some vitamin C and beta carotene and folic acid from the lettuce and tomatoes and onions. You're going to get some omega-3 essential fatty acids from the onions and the little sesame seeds on the top of the bun. You're going to get some B vitamin from the vitamin B enriched white flour in the bun. You're going to get some amino acids from the cheese if it's real cheese and the meat. You might get some calcium if it's real cheese on the sandwich, but that's it. But you could live to be 18 to 20 years of age. You might even be able to have babies and be fertile, you know, until 18, 20 years of age. But if all you're living on is hamburgers or cheeseburgers with lettuce and tomatoes and onions on a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're in trouble because plants cannot manufacture minerals. And most of our degenerative diseases, most of the things that kill us and worry us as we live are mineral deficiency diseases. Plants only need nine minerals to be happy. We need 60. Plants can do very well on three elements, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Farmers cannot afford to put in all 60 essential minerals. That's why they give animals pellets to make up that difference. They give them the pellets with all the nutrients in it to make up the difference because they don't know how many minerals are in that pasture. They could analyze it, but are they going to put 60 minerals in this pasture, this 10-acre pasture for these cows? No. So it's cheaper just to give the cow the pellets because they don't know how many minerals are in that hay or in that pasture. The longest-lived people in the industrialized nations, the one that have the highest average of longevity, are the Okinawans, and they live to be 85 on the average, and we live somewhere around 70, 72 on the average in America. And you go to Okinawa, it's 161 islands. Their soil is nothing but red sandy clay, much like the state of Georgia. There's a little bit of extra iron in there, but that wouldn't explain their 15 years living longer than us. And so I went there, spent almost a week, spent the first couple of days at the Department of Agriculture studying the soil and soil chemistry and plant chemistry there in Okinawa. Didn't find out anything really unique. And then we talked to the old people. We talked about 15 of them. Half of them were men, seven of them were men, eight were women. These were all 100-plus-year-olds. And we only had to ask one question because this is a 25-year study. 25-year study in the Okinawans. It was a identical twin doctors. One got a medical degree from Harvard. The other got his Ph.D. in pharmacy. And they spent 25 years there trying to figure out why the Okinawans lived so long. They counted how many steps they took, how many times a day they took a pee, what the volume of their pee was, how many hours they slept, how many calories they took in. At the end of the 25 years, they say, we don't know. I don't know. And so we weren't going to re-ask these questions. We only asked them one question. We got each one individually into a room so they wouldn't contaminate the others with their answers. We didn't want them thinking about the question. We only want them to hear the question give the answer. 
So the question was, what did you do with your wood ashes and your rice straw ashes from your heating and cooking from the previous day? And the men said, we don't know. You know, we're out there doing the samurai thing with the swords and doing the karate stuff, and we don't know. But the women, every one of them, gave the same story. Oh, we took the wood ashes and the rice straw ashes and put them in the garden, as our grandmothers and our mothers taught us to do, as a fertilizer. We mixed it in the noodle dough and the rice because it gave it a nicer taste and color. We turned it yellow instead of white. And then thirdly, we cut our salt with it. Ten parts wood ashes and rice straw ashes with one part salt. Because salt was very expensive, and so they would cut it, just like a drug dealer cuts expensive cocaine, so that it would last longer. So they got plant minerals in three different ways. as fertilizer in the garden, culinary ashes, mix it in their noodles and rice, and also by cutting their salt with it. And wood ashes and rice straw ashes are the plant minerals that are left when you burn away the carbon and the fuel. And people have been using plant minerals as a supplement since before written history. We know this from the Neanderthals. They were the first people to consciously bury their loved ones when they died, and they always put little pots of wood ashes with them. They never figured out why. Well, well, wood ashes are plant minerals. They make you live longer. And then they said one thing I didn't know. They said, and lastly, an ash merchant came by every morning. An ash merchant. Now, what does that tell you? An ash merchant came by every morning and would buy our excess wood ashes and our excess rice straw ashes, and they would sell these ashes to farmers who had fields that were much larger than their personal production of ash could fertilize. It was an industry because they knew it was important for fertilization of that field. The first patent in 1790, the first U.S. patent, U.S. patent number one, was how to make white wood ashes for export. They were burning tens of thousands of acres of forests. They just set those forests on fire and collect the wood ashes and ship them to England. That's because England had burned every tree on the British Isles. They were forced to go to coal, which they hated because of the smoke and all that kind of stuff. And because they burnt every tree, they were forced to use coal as a fuel. But after the first two years of mining coal, the mines flooded with water, and the king formed what he called the Royal Society to find a way to pump the water out of the mines. And they came up with a steam engine to pump the water out of the mines. And that started the Industrial Revolution because they'd burnt every tree. And so they were using the wood ashes from America for their food and their garden fertilizer and cutting their salt with it. And all this information is in the book, Hell's Kitchen, a lot of detail. But here's a little different recipe for those of you who are sports fans. Harold Stilson from Deerfield Beach, Florida, hits a hole-in-one in the 101st birthday. Went out to play golf on his 101st birthday, hits a hole-in-one, 108-yard, par-3 hole. I mean, this is his sixth one. They have to have good enough vision to see that stick holding up the flag at 108 yards. You've got to have a good grip on the club, good eye-hand coordination. Hit that little banny chicken egg-sized ball into a teacup-sized hole 108 yards away in one whack. Wouldn't you rather have that lifestyle than being in a nursing home at age 85? Hmm? And you know he doesn't have Alzheimer's disease because he's color-coordinated. <laughs> How many of you remember Art Linkletter? Okay, most of you are old enough to remember him. Uh, he wanted to live to be 100, and he was moved to want to live to be 100 by reading a Pulitzer Prize winning novel by the title Lost Horizon. Many of you won't remember that title, but the author, James Hilton, the one who won the Pulitzer Prize for writing that novel, coined a term in that book, Lost Horizon, called Shangri-La. How many of you heard of the term Shangri-La? Sure, everybody remembers that one. It was a mythical place you could live to be two, three hundred years of age if you followed their lifestyle, very clean cut lifestyle. Everybody had their own little garden, they put wood ashes in, and they did all kinds of other stuff. And this novel was actually written about real people called the Hunzas who live in what's now northern Pakistan. They were so famous for health and longevity. They were the longest lived and the healthiest people on earth. And so even the King of England sent his personal physician, one Sir Robert McCarrison, to go there for four years. Went there for four years to study how they live so long and take the information back to the king. And Robert McCarrison was such a scientist, he brought 4,000 white rats with him. And he set up 1,000 rats on the Hunza diet, 1,000 rats on the New Delhi diet, and 1,000 rats on the English diet. Well, during that four years, the English rats died of the most horrible diseases, became cannibals and ate each other. And the New Delhi rats lived a little bit longer, but they didn't serve much any better. They, they had all diabetes and high blood pressure and all that, died of liver cancer. But the Hunza rats, they had to kill them at the end of the four years. It's time to leave. None of them had died. So he came back and he said, King, he says, I don't know what it is, but it has something to do with the diet. He told the king about the experiment he'd run. So he says, here's a list of everything the Hunzas eat. And the king ate exactly as the Hunzas ate, and the king died at 72. Well, Art Linkletter hired an eye doctor by the name of Alan Bannock to go to Hunza and find out what their secret was. Alan Bannock was an eye doctor, but he was also an amateur farmer, and he didn't know exactly what he was looking for, but he went and he wrote down everything, how they tied their turban, how many steps they took each day, how much they slept, how much water they drank, how much of the volume of their pee, how many times they went to the number two. And he said, I don't know, but Art, here's all the information. Pick what you want. Of course, Alan Bannock's dead, and Art Linkletter celebrated his birthday on Larry King. At any rate, to make a long story short, there's two things in this book that jump out at you. Number one, they farm at 19,500-foot elevation. Their growing season is only 45 days. 
Now, the wheat and the corn and the rice we use, the growing season is 110 to 140 days. Can you grow those crops with a 45-day growing season? Nah. And so their total carbohydrate intake, because they couldn't grow rice and wheat as we know it and corn and that sort of stuff, squash and things, their sum total of their carbohydrate intake was a little chapati bread the size of a silver dollar pancake, one per person per day. That was it. The rest of their diet consisted of goat meat, lamb, mutton, chickens, eggs, cheese, butter, maybe some tomatoes and some green peppers and onions and garlic. And so it was a very low carbohydrate, very high animal fat, very high animal protein diet. And we know from animal experiments that when you have a low carbohydrate diet, you can double and triple lifespans of animals if you give them all the nutrients. It's called undernutrition without malnutrition. You have to triple the vitamins and minerals and cut the carbohydrate intake by two-thirds, and you'll triple their lifespan. Cut the carbohydrate intake, triple the vitamins and minerals, and we can triple their lifespan. It's that easy. And number two, he noted in this book very clearly that they took their wood ashes every morning and mixed it in the garden. They cut their food with it and their salt with it. They put in their food as culinary ashes and cut their salt with it. Kind of like the Okinawans. Isn't that amazing? This is a beautiful story. It really gives you some insight. There's this wonderful article in the Houston Chronicle. It was about the discovery of natural gas in Bolivia, a country in South America. And they were arguing, who's going to get the money? The indigenous people, you know, the Native Americans, so to speak, or the Native South Americans, uh, or the government. They were arguing about this. But the most important thing of this article to me was this picture and the little legend underneath. It said, Bruno Paza, one of Bolivia's indigenous Amira Indians, holds a bowl of llama manure he's using to feed his cooking fire. A little one foot by two foot cast iron stove soot on the walls. He needs spring clean and bad. You know it's cold in there. If you've ever been in a cabin with a fireplace, your front end is cooking and your back end is cold. He's got three shirts, a sweatshirt, a parka, his ear flaps are down in his house. And he's feeding his fire. His fuel is animal manure. Did Americans ever use animal manure as fuel? Absolutely. Buffalo chips. Do you think they came to Vegas to get buffalo chips? There's no trees on the prairie, so they use horse manure. And they send the kids out with buckets to get all the road apples and stuff like that, you know. And so we burned animal manure as fuel. Bundles of grass, trees, wood, all kinds of stuff. No indoor plumbing, no electricity, no, no, no clinics, no doctors, no pharmacies, no pharmacists, no pharmaceuticals, no drugs, no social security, no insurance, no Blue Cross Blue Shield, no HMOs. I mean, they got nothing you would go there for. So what makes them interesting to me was when you look at the book Rare Earths Forbidden Cures and you go to the chapter entitled The Age Beaters, not The Egg Beaters, but The Age Beaters, the people that live around Lake Titicaca, Bolivia, Peru, and Chile in this area, have more hundred-year-olds per population than anybody else in the world. One per 500. In America, we have one per 10,000. They have 20 times the hundred-year-olds we do. Think about that. They have nothing that you would go there for other than long life and happiness. Now, this remained the same since before written history until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882. We know the exact moment when everything changed. Monday, September 4th, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 1882, when this guy came along, well, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882, Thomas Edison pulled the switch and turned on the first commercial. Actually, he didn't do it. His chief electrical technician, a guy by the name of Jonathan Leaves, pulled on the switch and turned on the first commercial electric generating plant in the world. By 1909, there was no less than a dozen patented kitchen electrical appliances. The first one was a toaster, interestingly enough, then a skillet. There were rice cookers and, and crock pots and blenders and steam irons and all kinds of electrical appliances. By 1950, every city and every industrialized nation had completely given up wood as a fuel and had gone to electricity and propane and natural gas and liquid paraffin and kerosene and heating oils for heating and cooking. Here comes the most profound question you've ever had in your life. How many wood ashes are left over when you cook and heat with electricity and propane and liquid paraffin and natural gas? It's a numeral that looks like this and begins with a Z. Zero! And there was no great gathering of doctors. There was no great gathering of doctors wringing their hands saying, Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? People have been using wood ashes as a source of nutritional minerals since before written history. And now suddenly in the space of, of just 70 years, after thousands and thousands of years of using wood ashes and rice straw ashes and peat moss ashes as fertilizer and, and supplements in our food as culinary ashes and, and cutting our salt with it, in a 70-year period, just a little blip on the radar, it's gone. And nobody said, well, where are we going to get our... Our minerals. Doctors didn't do that. They just, whoa, this is exciting. Electricity. Now we can get brighter lights in the surgery room. There was no congressional hearings. There was no Senate investigations. I mean, there was nothing going on. And now we're paying the price. Now we're paying the price. Because all the epidemics, which we're going to talk about here, of degenerative diseases are caused by mineral deficiencies. Here's another one of my favorites. Ralph Charles, back in October of 1999, turned 100. And nice little newspaper write-up on his 100th birthday. And the thing that was interesting to me was he was still piloting commercial charter flights at age 100. 
had no restrictions on his health paper licenses, didn't have Alzheimer's disease, didn't have macular degeneration, no cataracts. Does he look like that recipe of a 100-year-old? No, he looks like he's in his 80s to me. He looks 20 years younger than his age. And so these are things we know. We can fly airplanes at 100. We can hit holes in one at 101 if we follow the right recipe. This gal, Connie Douglas Reeves, turned 101. And the day that she turned 101, they inducted her into the Cowgirl Hall of Fame because she had taught 30,000 young women how to ride Western saddle and how to barrel race. I mean, she's a legend in Texas. And they inaugurated her and inducted her into the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. Now, to me, she looks like one of those mean, feisty, rebellious patients. She's got her thumbs in her belt, her shoulders are back, her chin is up. You just imagine her doctor saying to her, Connie, I need you to give up salt now. You're 101. i, I got to worry about your blood pressure. Connie, I, I really need you to give up eggs and red meat and chicken skin and, and dairy products and go to margarine and boneless, skinless chicken breast. And I want you to eat tofu instead of red meat. And, and I need you to, in fact, use egg beaters instead of eggs and use margarine instead of butter. And Connie's going to ponder for a minute and then say, ah! <laughs> Doc, I've been using salt and eating butter and red meat and eggs and chicken skin before your barn. I ain't going to give them up now. Let's give her a hoo-ah. hoo <laughs> Okay, this is kind of a cute one. These guys are in the Guinness World Book of Records, Percy and Florence Aerosmith in Hereford, England. And they were put in the Guinness World Book of Records, not because of their age, but because they'd been married to each other for 80 years. And the Guinness Book of World Records asked them what their secret was. She said she drank a glass of red wine for breakfast and had a shot of whiskey before bed. And he said, well, I guess I can render it down to two words. And, and boy, they whipped out their pens and they were ready for this profound two words. And they said, well, what is it? And he said, yes, ma'am. If you're changing pace here a little bit, in April of 1990, the World Health Center and the, the Center for Disease Control did a survey in the top 32 industrialized nations. They said out of the top 32 industrialized nations, the United States ranked 17th in the world in health and longevity. Now, we spend more money for health care than all the other nations in the world put together. There's 92 nations. We spend more money for health care than the other 91. And yet, in April of 1990, we ranked 17th. And Japan was number one. Let's give them a hoo-ah for being number one. Hoo-ah! 79.1, we were 75. Well, 10 years later, when they redid the study, Japan maintained number one at 74.5, but they had dropped five years, four point something years they dropped, but they still maintained number one, but America dropped from 17th to 24th because we went from 75 to 70, that 10 year period, from April of 1990 to June of 2000. Well, five years later, in August of 2005, the World Health Organization, Center for Disease Control, did another survey, and they published this in Newsweek magazine, I love this. Special edition, summer of 2005. It was on the stands until August 2005. The future of medicine, your health in the 21st century. And they talked about new treatments. These are theoretical treatments, not existing ones for cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes. You know, they wanted more money for donations. And then in the article number one, on page 10, there's this wonderful little paragraph. It said, America has built the world's highest high-tech medicine system in the world. I don't think we can argue with that. Uh, surgeons don't even do surgery anymore. Robots do it, just like car assembly plants. Robots do most of the bone surgery now because they make so many mistakes in hip replacement, shoulder replacement surgery. They anesthetize you and then they put you under this robot and the robot cuts your bone off and sticks the, the new joint in there. And the robot does it all now because it's much more accurate than a human being. The uh, doctor's in the back room drinking beer and sucking on a cigarette while the robot's doing the surgery. <laughs> the sentence goes on to say, and yet the nation, meaning America, now ranks 46th and longevity. Now there's 45 other countries whose peoples live longer than us. In 2005, the entire world spent $2.7 trillion for health care. Now that $2.7 trillion the world spent, we alone spent $1.9 trillion, more than two-thirds, and we rank 46th in the world. Our health care system sucks, would be a kind way of putting it. You're not getting the bang for the buck, and you, not a single one of you in this room would put up with that in any other industry. You would not put up with this in any other industry. It's time for us to be the Home Depot of health care. People are looking for it. <laughs> and then even worse, it goes on and says, and 41 other countries, including Cuba, for God's sakes, have achieved lower rates of infant mortality. They have a higher rate of babies surviving the first year and being born alive than we do. Cuba! Think about that. A poor, non-industrialized, communist nation does a better job of live births and first-year survivability of our babies than us. Whose fault is that? Well, it's the medical system's fault. It's the medical doctor's fault. It's the pediatrician's fault. It's the OBGYN's fault. Now, there's things we can do immediately. They're going to be fun, and you'll love to do them, and you will do them. I guarantee you, it's just so easy. There's some things you won't like to change, and you're going to drag your toes and say, well, Doc, isn't there anything else I can change? I don't want to give that one up. So I'm going to show you one of each, and you'll get kind of a clue. 
This is out of the British Medical Journal, which is the equivalent of the Journal of the American Medical Association. This was uh, December 23rd, 1997, and it's a big study, a big, huge study on uh, more than a thousand men between the ages of 45 and 59. Remember, this is the British Medical Journal. This is not a comic book or a newspaper even. They said, frequent sex helps men live longer. Hua! <laughs> those men who had sex twice a week live 50% longer than those who have sex only once a month. So ladies, if you have a keeper, well, that's a keeper. If the guy you want to keep, you know how to keep him. If you have a dumpster, <laughs> you want to drop kick that sucker someplace without going to jail, you know how to accomplish it, right? Well, this study came out the same month, December 4th, though, a couple of weeks early, the sex one, 1997. This was a study that was actually uh, started in 1990, but they didn't report it until 1997. What they did was look at the uh, longevity of people county by county in the United States. I mean, they went county by county and calculated the longevity, and they get it color coding. The people who are the longest lived people in America in the upper Midwest and the Plain states. We're talking about eastern Montana, north and south Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, northern Missouri, eastern Nebraska, and Kansas. These are the longest lived people in America in the upper Midwest and the Plains states. The shortest lived people in America come from the southeast part of the United States, the old south, if you will, from Chesapeake Bay down to central Texas. There's a very distinct demarcation. And this in the old south is called the heart attack, stroke, and cancer belt of America. How many have ever heard that phrase before? Yeah, in the southeast part of the United States, this is a cancer, heart attack, and stroke belt of America. The people in the upper Midwest and the Plains states live 20 years longer than the people in the south. 20 years longer! They have the same insurance, they have the same medications, the same idiot doctors, the same hospitals. Got the same. And yet the people in the upper Midwest in the Plain States live 20 years longer. What's the difference? Well, the people in the upper Midwest in the Plain States primarily, there's exceptions of course, but primarily, at least historically and culturally in those areas, they cook everything by roasting and stewing. How do people cook in the Old South? Frying. There is fried potatoes and fried fish and fried chicken and chicken fried steak and fried green tomatoes and fried okra and fried hush puppies. I mean, it's been alleged that people in the Old South even fry water. <laughs> and because of the free radicals and the trans fatty acids that are created by frying, the rate of cancer and heart attack and stroke is higher. And so if you do nothing else and ever, ever, ever put a French fry or anything fried in your mouth, you will add 20 healthful years to your life. Whoa. Hoo-ah! And you'll save a lot of money in cleaning up your home. It's a lot easier to clean up your home when you've stewed as opposed to frying. So you're going to save a lot of money and you'll add 20 healthy years to your life if you never again eat anything fried. Goodbye churches. Goodbye Popeye. Goodbye French fries. I mean, I can go into McDonald's and have a nice sandwich and a salad now. I don't eat the French fries. I don't, I don't drink the soft drinks. You, you can go to McDonald's and have a nice meal, but you don't want to eat the fried stuff. That, that's where the dangerous part. You know, my tape, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, doctors were always angry with me because they said doctors only lived to be 58. So they redid their own study. And to make a long story short, they came out five years later. In all the medical journals, they said, Wallach lied. <laughs> he lied. He wasn't right. Doctors don't live to be 58. Like Wallach said, they live to be 56. <laughs> I missed it by two years. So they don't bother me on that one anymore. And they were obligated to publish it because somebody had donated the money for the study. So why do we listen to a group of people whose average lifespan is 56 on longevity? Oh, that's not very bright. What do doctors die from? Diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer. Hello? <laughs> My favorite doctor obituaries are the fitness doctors, the sports medicine doctors who die at 38 while jogging. I love the ones who are cardiologists. They're the, they teach cardiology at Harvard Medical School and die at 48 of a heart attack. Why, why do we listen to those people? Oh, they're, they're, they're doctors. Well, there's general contractors who have licenses from the state to, to build buildings and bridges and roads. Yet people still go to Home Depot and paint their own house and retile their own house and fix a loose board on a porch. It's time, folks. People still go to doctors because they don't know that there's options available. Who's going to tell them there's options? We are! <laughs> Exercise without supplementation is suicide. What do all athletes do regardless of sports? They sweat. And if you're sweating and you're not replacing all that soup of nutrients that are coming out in your sweat, you're doomed to either break down like Theo did. Thank God he didn't die. But he broke down physically because all the nutrients required to maintain and repair his cartilage and ligaments and tendons, connective tissue and bone and, and muscle weren't there. And so he broke down under the stress of all this high performance activity. You give all this stuff back, he, he kind of regrew everything. Isn't that amazing? What a concept. 
Exercise without supplementation is suicide. Many of you remember the Grinkoffs, really good-looking couple, Russian couple. They were the darlings of the Paris figure skating world. He died of cardiomyopathy heart disease at age 28. Won four gold medals, two in the Olympics and two of the World Games. Had everything going for him. Money, fame, bam, 28 dies. Cardiomyopathy heart attack. What's that caused by? A deficiency of? Selenium. Very good. Walter Payton died of liver disease, waiting for a liver transplant. Mr. Clean never drank, never did drugs, was a gentleman, but he sweat, and he just drank water. Are the dark side, Gatorade. Uh, I love this crowd. <laughs> and it's really, these are tragic stories. This gal here, Rolanda Pierce, 19 years old, great basketball player for Florida State University, 19 years old, a freshman, six foot five, had all the moves, good looking, very bright young woman. She was expected to be kind of the Michael Jordan of the WNBA. She was going to be the, the female version of Michael Jordan when she graduated college and got into the Women's National Basketball Association. She died of a ruptured aneurysm at 19 years of age. What did she die from? A copper deficiency. Exactly. All the money and all the future and all the potential she had went away because she was living on Coca-Cola and French fries and no supplementation because the sports medical doctor at that university told her you can get everything you need beating your basic four food groups. French fries, Coca-Cola, fried chicken. Reggie Lewis had it all, captain of the Boston Celtics. Had his first cardiomyopathy heart attack, 28 years old, collapsed. They gathered together 12 of the best cardiologists in the world. They called them the dream team of cardiology, paid them a million dollars each to refer all their patients out to other doctors so they could devote full time to Reggie. They wanted him back on the floor. He was a powerhouse. He was a leader. He made things happen. And he was kind of like the Theo Ratliff of those days. And what a great kid he was. Clean as you could be. A great example for everybody. But while they were arguing... Who is going to get famous by doing the heart transplant or installing a pacemaker? He dies of his second cardiomyopathy heart attack two weeks later. Well, God has a great way of bringing justice to the evil. A year and a half later, the captain of the dream team of cardiologists, one Dr. W. Thomas Nessa, taught cardiology at Harvard, ran the Boston Marathon every year, was as fit as you could be, a person who believed in fitness and so was a fitness nut himself, dies of a cardiomyopathy heart attack in his home at age 48. Now, if he was my cardiologist and he said exercise without supplementation was good, I would lay on the couch. I would never blink. I would not do anything that resembled physical activity. If he said salt was bad, I would take the top off the salt shaker and I'd be guzzling that stuff. If he said eggs were bad because of the cholesterol, I'd be eating 25 a day because I wouldn't want to wind up like him. Even though he was an expert, he's a dead expert. And they don't lie. They don't lie. <laughs> Wilma Rudolph, another Olympic legend died of brain cancer at age 54 after winning three gold medals in a single Olympics in the 19, was it 1960 Olympics? She died of brain cancer. Nope, not arsenic. Nope. Gallium. Ah, I can tell who's reading the book, Rare Earths Forbidden Cures, Chapter 11, under G, gallium. It's a gallium deficiency. Big British study. I cite the study, no doubt about it. Corey Stringer, 350-pound offensive tackle for the Minnesota Vikings. Had it all, rich athlete, but they wanted him to lose 50 pounds so he could play for a string that year. So they put him in a rubber suit, didn't give him any water and didn't give him any salt. 102 degrees, Minnesota in the summer in August, and he collapses with heat stroke. Everybody has a cell phone, 911. Here comes the ambulance. Five or ten minutes later, they arrive. Now, Corey weighs 350 pounds, and they hook him up in an IV. Boy, they got the EMTs. They hook him up to an IV. Is that enough? fluid for him? No. What they should have done was taken that big Gatorade bucket full of ice, put it on him. They should have ripped his trousers off and stuck the hose from the garden up his rump and give him a cold water enema, bring his core temperature down from 107 to 98.6, and Corey Stringer would still be alive today. But everybody's waiting for the doctors to do it. Now, if there had been an Eagle Scout there, he'd have lived. But all poor Corey had was the top Sports medicine doctors. <laughs> Gatorade nutrients. Sodium, potassium, both of which are useful, but that's only two. What about the other 58 minerals? What about the gallium? What about the selenium? What about the zinc? What about the copper? Zero, 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 zero. People say, well, it's not convenient. Well, then die. <laughs> Yeah, death is a very inconvenient thing. If you want to know what's going on in health, read Time and Newsweek magazine.
big article on high blood pressure. The stealth killer, America's high blood pressure crisis is spinning out of control. How can we have a high blood pressure crisis? We've got calcium channel blockers, we've got beta blockers, we've got all these diuretics, and we have exercise and fitness systems, more people involved with that than ever before. People are losing weight, you know, the obesity problem is hopefully getting under control. We're doing everything the doctors say, and it's spinning out of control. That's because you cannot fix a mineral deficiency problem with surgery and drugs. Amen. What's the first thing a good farmer puts out for his livestock out in the pasture? A salt block or a salt lick, isn't it? There's nobody out in the pasture telling a cow she's limited to one lick a day, is there? No, I refuse to believe that my human patients are dumber than a cow or a goat or something like that. And so they say, go ahead and salt your food to taste. Well, how do I know if it's too much? Well, it'll taste salty. If it's... That's high tech as I can get. July 1997. Presentation at the American Heart Association's annual meeting in Portland, Oregon. Doctors lack proof that too much salt is unhealthful. After years of telling healthy people that too much salt isn't good for them, researchers still don't have solid evidence to back up that claim. The same study, it's called the Sodium Task Force, just a different newspaper, they kind of came at it a little different direction. They said, the study, the Sodium Task Force found, that people who limited their salt intake to 1,000 milligrams or one gram a day like their doctors wanted them to do, had 600% more or six times more heart attacks than those who defy their doctors and consume more than double. If you followed your doctor's instructions, you're not going to make it. So says September 2000 Scientific American. Remember that? If you take your, your diuretics, it's only going to get rid of more minerals. Scientific American, February 1999. They went to... Nigeria, out in the bush, where people have never seen a doctor in a white coat, they've never seen a stethoscope, they've never heard of diuretics or calcium channel blockers, and they started taking blood pressures, and they found that 7% of these people living out in a very primitive circumstances out in the bush, 7% had high blood pressure. They came back to Chicago, did a lot of DNA testing, found a lot of people whose ancestors had originated in Nigeria during the old slave trade days in the 16, 1700s, and they started taking their blood pressure, and 33% of them had high blood pressure. They knew immediately, without doing another single one penny's worth of research, that it's not genetic. Because it was genetic, it'd be 7% and 7%, or 33% and 33%, because where you are in the world will not change how genetics expresses itself. If you have a genetic problem in Nigeria, you're going to have the same genetic problem in Bolivia. If you have that same genetic problem in Bolivia, you're going to have the same genetic problem in New York. It doesn't matter where you are on earth. If you have a genetic problem, you have a genetic problem. So you know immediately, fourth grade biology is not genetic. So what's the difference here? Well, the people in Nigeria out in the bush are still putting their wood ashes, their plant minerals into their food. They're still fertilizing their garden with it. They still use wood as a fuel. And the guys in Chicago are living on diuretics and calcium channel blockers and statin drugs to lower cholesterol and Church's fried chicken and Pepsi Cola and Coca Cola, Gatorade, hua. Okay, now, six years later, the British Medical Journal. Six years later, the British Medical Journal, remember guys, the same one that said sex twice a week is give you 50% more longevity. Who -ah. So we got to believe them, right? High blood pressure in blacks, not genetic. This is January 2005. High blood pressure in blacks, not genetic. High blood pressure in whites, not genetic. High blood pressure in human beings, not genetic. High blood pressure is not genetic. You've heard me say many times, we've eliminated 900 different diseases in animals with those little pellets and canned dog food with all the vitamins and minerals in it. Well, dogs and canaries and worms and crickets and, and monkeys and guinea pigs can all get high blood pressure. Cows get high blood pressure. But they don't get it when you give them those little pellets because we have everything in there to prevent the high blood pressure because we don't have insurance to pay for these drugs and surgeries and things. How do you tell a dog, well, you better sign up for a fitness center and take you know, diuretics and calcium channel blocker? And so... If we do what we've done for our animals, we cannot fail. We can eliminate high blood pressure not only in, in the world, but we can eliminate high blood pressure in the black community, in the white community, in the human community, in 90 days if everybody would take all 90 essential nutrients. Focus on the intake of what? Calcium! And stay away from the fried foods, stay away from the carbonated drinks. And watch what happens to that high blood pressure. I'd rather take the drugs, I just can't give up my Popeyes. You're going to die. Whether you believe it or not, how many of you have ever heard that elevated cholesterol and triglycerides are the basic root cause of coronary artery disease and artery disease? Sure, we've all heard that, right? Well, if you can find me any disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides, it'll give you a million dollars. There's not a single disease caused by elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides. It's a signal that you have a deficiency of niacin, vitamin B3, a deficiency of chromium vanadium, a deficiency of omega-3 essential fatty acids. You could have uh, early hypothyroidism or goiter. You can have early diabetes. All those things will cause elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides, but elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides cause no disease. And so that's why all these statin drugs and all the aspirin that everybody's been taking, all this stuff 
We now rank 46th in the world in longevity, doing what doctors have told us, spending $1.9 trillion a year for health care. We rank 46th in the world. Does that make any kind of sense? You're an MBA. Does that make any kind of sense? No. Huh? Bad investment. Bad investment. Bad investment. Come in 46th and you're spending more than all the other 91 nations in the world put together. Here's this little Bolivia and they're using llama manure for fuel. They have 20 times the 100 year olds than we do. Hello? Are, are we getting a clue here? So what causes coronary artery disease? What causes clogged arteries? What causes it? How many of you heard of free radicals, trans fatty acids? Yeah. Where does it come from? Well, look at that. And we've known this for 50 years. But doctors say, oh, you got to give up that dairy products and butter and animal fats. And you got to go to, to margarine and, and cooking oils. Well, they live to be 56. Why do you believe them? They die of heart attacks and strokes. Why would you believe them? I want you to think of your grandparents, your moms and dads, and your aunts and uncles. How many of you had a mom or dad or aunt or uncle or grandparents who lived to be in their 80s and 90s? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many of you had any of them live to be in the hundreds? Hundred. Yeah, there's a handful in here. And I guarantee you they ate four to six eggs for breakfast. They ate butter instead of margarine. They didn't have margarine back in those days. They ate butter. They cooked in lard. They ate their chicken skin. Can you imagine, any, can you imagine my grandfather tearing the chicken skin off the chicken before he ate it? Using anything else but real butter? Eating tofu on a beef farm? Hello? So it's the free radical damage, the lining of the arteries that causes coronary artery disease. Well, you get rid of the free radicals in your life. Why is that called the heart attack, stroke, and cancer belt of America in the Old South? Fried foods. Gosh, this is so easy. Give up the fried foods. You take in all your antioxidants, selenium, OPC. Very easy. My blood pressure is 121 over 71. My resting pulse is 47. If I were to go to a doctor for a physical, now they would have a hemorrhage. They'd send me in for a pacemaker. What? Your resting pulse is 47? You're going to have a heart attack. Really? Well, let's see who can lift the most weight and keep alive here, Doc. Also, low cholesterol makes you stupid. <laughs> I love that study. Well, they took almost uh, 800 men and 1,100 women. They divided them into two groups. Those with blood cholesterols below 200, which they thought were going to be the healthiest and smartest, and those with blood cholesterols above 240. And the ones who had blood cholesterols above 240, we're 49% smarter than the ones who have blood cholesterol below 200. hoo -ah. <laughs> Low-fat diets lose their luster for heart attack, stroke, breast cancer, colon cancer. There's no difference in the rate between a low-fat diet and a high-fat diet. No difference whatsoever. Obesity is now the number one preventable killer. There's 16% of American kids who are obese. Now, this is despite all these surgeries, beside all the drugs. Uh, there's more people involved with fitness than ever before. And that's because we're living on too much carbohydrates and not enough people are taking in nutrients, especially minerals. Sweet fruit drinks make pudgy kids fatter. Fruit juice, fruit juice. I'm not giving my kid Pepsi. I'm giving him apple juice. We're living on dry cereals and apple juice. They go to school with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They come home and eat Kraft's macaroni and cheese, and the parents think they're giving them a good diet. There's nothing but carbohydrates and sugar. There's not even anything green and leafy or tomatoes in there. Nothing. Nothing but sugar and carbohydrates. No vitamins and minerals. And the kid's, you know, got ADD and ADHD. And, and you know he's going to be a serial killer when he grows up. <laughs> well, this is the cause of obesity in America. Pica. You've all read about pica or cribbing. Uh, the only thing that will cause this behavior where they eat dirt or chew on the fence or uh, wooden implements and things like that is a mineral deficiency. Some minerals are worse than others, but all mineral deficiencies cause this behavior in animals, pike or cribbing, where they eat other things other than food. And it's not boredom, it's they're minerally deficient. Pregnant women are legendary for getting cravings during pregnancy. Why is that? Because the baby, as it's developing, is stealing minerals from the mother, and if she's not taking in enough to counteract that, they crave things. In the Old South, where they have the heart attack, stroke, and cancer belt of America, they eat um, cornstarch. How many of you have heard of women eating cornstarch when they're pregnant? Yeah. And what about clay? They go out in the yard and eat clay when they're pregnant. In fact, people come and say, Doc, am I sick? Am I crazy? I, I have this craving for clay. No, you're just pregnant, my dear. It's so common in the Old South. You go to a grocery store into the dairy section, they got these little bags of yellow clay, red clay, orange clay, blue clay, black clay. You can have your choice. Whichever one flips your switch. I love this one. Eating dirt may be good for you. Don't take vitamins and minerals. You can overdose, but eat dirt. <laughs> Experts claim the habit of eating clay may be beneficial for pregnant women. Now, what is in clay? Clay is minerals. <laughs> and the woman says, 
The real good stuff is smooth, tastes just like candy. Mm. The habit of eating clay or dirt is known as geophagy, geo for earth and phagy for eat. Some experts lump it into the same category as pica, which is the uh, abnormal urge to eat coins, paint, soap, and other non-food items such as wood ashes, plant minerals. And so there was a natural drive for pregnant women at the dawn of history to eat wood ashes and dirt and clay and things for looking for minerals as those babies drove them to be minerally deficient. I could say a lot of things about a lot of diseases, but I'm going to just go to selenium when it comes to cancer. You've all heard my tape. I hope you've all heard the tape, but Dead Doctors Don't Lie. And on there, I was reading this, and of course, doctors turned me over to every agency in the world because I had found an anti-cancer diet. I was just reading this, and of course, when I made that tape, I just read it. An anti-cancer diet has been found. They interpreted that I was claiming that I had made an anti-cancer diet. And what they did was look at these vitamins and minerals. And uh, dietary supplements such as vitamin C, retinol, which is a form of vitamin A, zinc, riboflavin, vitamin B2, and molybdenum, which is a trace mineral, niacin B3, had no statistically significant effect on cancer deaths over the five years. Well, it takes a little bit longer for them to do things. However, in a group of middle-aged people, I think there was 29,000 people between the age of 49 and 60, during the same five-year period, those who took only beta-carotene, vitamin E, and the trace mineral selenium for five years, the results were striking. 13% fewer deaths from all cancers, 20% reduction deaths from stomach cancer, which is very high in that portion of China, and a 9% disappearance of deaths from all causes, just by taking those three supplements. And of course, they were very low doses. They were just a portion of the RDA. Well, in 1912, 1912 in Popular Mechanics, that wonderful medical journal, written so you can understand it, Dr. Wasserman, who invented the Wasserman test, which is that blood test a lot of his old guys had to take before he got married to get a license, detected syphilis. He had an active case of syphilis. Hua. He had discovered a chemical substance, which turned out to be selenium, that will cure cancer in mice. He went on to say that selenium has a selective action against cancer cells, but didn't hurt healthy tissues. He went on to say that the cancer in mice is so similar to that in humans, he believed that an important advance had been made toward the cure of that veritable scourge cancer in people. Well, in 1912, when this came out, we began to put selenium into animal foods. It stayed dormant in interest to medical doctors until December of 1996, 84 years later, when this came out, uh, Dr. Larry Clark, a medical doctor, I have to give him credit, medical doctor, PhD from University of Arizona, and he did the gold standard in medical research. He did a randomized double-blind study in 1,300 people for seven years. Half of them got 200 micrograms or one-fifth of a milligram of selenium. The other half got sugar pills or placebos. And to make a long story short, his final analysis showed taking selenium slashed the occurrence, not the risk, but slashed the actual occurrence, which is much more powerful than slashing the risk slash the occurrence of prostate cancer by 69%, colorectal cancer by 64%, and lung cancer by 39%. Two months after this wonderful news came out, Dr. Larry Clark, MD, PhD, dies of prostate cancer at age 52. He didn't take selenium because he didn't believe in it. He actually purposely avoided selenium because he believed in chemotherapy because that's how he made his living. And so it cost him his life. He didn't even make it to 56, died of 52 of prostate cancer. Nobody should die of prostate cancer. No link found between fat and breast cancer. High fiber diets don't protect you. Multivitamins cut colon cancer risk. 90,000 nurses, Harvard Nurses Health Study. 15 years on a multivitamin. Reduce the risk of colon cancer by 75% in these 90,000 women. Reduce the risk of colon cancer by 75% for like $2 a day. Are there any drugs that will reduce the risk of colon cancer by 1%? No. Here's a little nutritional formula. Will reduce your risk of colon cancer by 75%. It's going to cost you half of what it costs for an espresso latte from Starbucks. And people say, I don't know. I, I, I can't remember to do that in the morning. Well, then die. And so, fortunately, there's always a small group of people who will survive. Just like in Katrina, there was a group of people who, when they got the word that it was coming, and the storm filled the entire Gulf of Mexico, or as they say in Texas, the entire Gulf of Mexico, they, they little old people, little bags of water, they start walking west. Three days later when it hit, they were 100 miles away. And the ones who stayed, eh, the government will save us. <laughs> that FEMA will do it. Mm. Okay, I think I get diabetes and arthritis in the last 10 minutes I have here. There's a diabetes epidemic. Went up more than 50% in four years. Despite all this wondrous medical care, and that's why we now rank 46th in the world in health and longevity. And so all the insulin and all the exercise programs and all the amputations and all the blindness and all the stuff we go through is unnecessary. We can eliminate high blood pressure 
and diabetes in the black community, the white community, the human community in 90 days if everybody would do the right thing. And so diabetes rate soars for Americans in their 30s. It used to be called adult onset type 2 diabetes because it only occurred in people over age 50. Well, now newborn babies are having it. Minority kids have the worst risk. If you take the white kids out of the ratios, it's not 16% of the kids that have obesity and diabetes. Guess what? It's 50% of the kids. Okay? It's the Hispanics, the Native Americans, the black community. And that's because, not genetic, it's because of how they eat. Heavy kids getting grown-up diseases. High blood pressure, clogged arteries, diabetes, showing up in babies. Is that because it's genetic? No, it's because they're eating fried foods. They're living on soft drinks and Pop-Tarts and Pillsbury toaster strudels and apple juice. My fear is everybody in America is going to eat dry cereal and, and apple juice for breakfast. They have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch. And they come home and they eat Kraft's macaroni and cheese. And they think they're getting good food. And we wonder why they're obese. We wonder why they have diabetes. We wonder why they have growing pains. We wonder why they have ADD. We wonder why they have thyroid problems. We wonder why they have clogged arteries. The doctor says, well, it's genetic. Your great-great-grandfather's dog had it, so therefore, you know, that's, uh, I knew it was in your family. This is a big study, 91,000 nurses, eight years, the Harvard Nurses Health Study. The women in the study who drank at least one sugar sweetened soda, it didn't matter if it was classic Coke, Pepsi Cola, Mountain Dew, Sprite, 7-Up, um, ginger ale, natural, organic, carbonated drinks, didn't matter. Pellegrino water, Perrier water, if it's carbonated, club soda, doesn't matter. 85% more likely to get diabetes. If you drink two a day, you're going to get it. How many have ever seen a teenager just drink two? Unless it's those 42-ounce gulps each of which has three 12-ounce Cokes in them. There's nine teaspoons of sugar per 12-ounce drink. Now, if they're drinking 10 a day, that's 90 teaspoons of sugar. Put 90 teaspoons of sugar in a mixing bowl and see what your kids are drinking. you got to change it, folks. This is a page out of Rare Earths Forbidden Cures. We'll just look at chromium as one of the two trace minerals that are missing when you have diabetes. And, of course, there's 23 cofactors necessary for them to work. We learned this in 1957, that we could prevent and cure. We could prevent and cure diabetes in laboratory animals, pet animals, and farm animals in 1957 with these two trace minerals. We proved it in human beings 20 years later in 1977. Do doctors use this stuff? No. There's no money in it. There's no money in the cure. The money's in. You're going to be on this insulin for the rest of your life. And so we have to show them that there is an option. Well, they went back. The same people who discovered this in 1957 went back to 1948, and they just looked at chromium. 1948, the amount of chromium in American blood was a big range, 28 to 1,000 parts per billion. In 71, it dropped to 13. 72, it dropped to 10. 73, it dropped to 4.7 to 5.1. In 74, it dropped to 0 0.73 to 1.6. In 78, it dropped to 0 0.16. In 80, it popped up almost three times, uh, 0 0.43. That's because in 1977, they came out and said, you can prevent and cure diabetes with these trace minerals. University of Vancouver, British Columbia said you could re replace insulin with these trace minerals. They came out big headlines and said it. And everybody went into the health food store and they tried it. And so everybody's level of, of chromium in their blood went up for a couple of years. And then it dropped back down in 1985 to 0 0.13 because it wouldn't work. Well, why won't the chromium vanadium by themselves work? Because they need 23 cofactors. You ever hear me say take chromium vanadium? No. You take the 90 essential nutrients because they're hooked together like a web. Hoo -ah. Arthritis. 85% of all Americans over the age of 50 already have arthritis and osteoporosis of one time or another to one degree or another. There's not a single medical treatment, that's according to the Center for Disease Control of Atlanta, Georgia, not me. And there's not a single medical treatment designed to prevent or cure osteoporosis or arthritis. There's not a single medical treatment designed to prevent or cure. The only approach that the medical system has is pain relief and surgery. Pain relief and surgery. We eliminated arthritis and osteoporosis in animals 300 years ago in Europe and a thousand years ago in China. We've known for a thousand years how to prevent and cure osteoporosis and, and arthritis. I'll give you a little hint. People hear me say that all the time. Well, that can't be. How many of you have heard of in the old herbal days, in the old homeopathic days, you know, hundreds of years ago in, in China, thousands of years ago, there's a term when they didn't know what to use, what herb to use to treat a disease, they always started out with like treats like. How many of you heard that term? Like treats like. L-I-K-E treats L-I-K-E. So if you had a blood disease, you'd take a herb that was red. If you had a brain disease, you ate walnuts because a walnut looked like a brain. And so that's called theory of signatures, the rule of signatures, meaning you, you take an herb or something that looks like the part of the body that you want to fix, and then it's a place as a starting point. And sometimes it was a great treatment, sometimes it wasn't. 
And so when you had a bone problem a thousand years ago, what did the old root doctors and what did the old shamans and the old voodoo doctors do a thousand years ago? When you had a bone problem, what did they make you eat? Bones! How difficult is this? Now you can't do that anymore. <sighs> Because there's lead in bones, and they, they took it off the market for human use. The coming epidemic of arthritis. I mean, what a sick article. I mean, the, coming, the bad news is research shows the disease starts attacking your joints before middle age. Well, they start attacking your joints when you're two. How many of you heard of growing pains? Yeah, if you want to have fun, go to a mall and just sit in a chair and look at kids. Don't look up above three feet. Just look at little kids. Go to a zoo and sit on a bench and just look at kids. Don't look at the animals. Don't look at the people. Just look at kids. Now, you don't see any walking kids anymore. This mother, this 25-year-old mother, has an 18-wheeler baby cart. She's got a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, and she's got a six-month-old on her back. And she's struggling along with this 18-wheeler baby cart. Now, they're living on apple juice and dry cereal and Fruit Loops for breakfast, and they're getting peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch, and they're getting Kraft macaroni and cheese for dinner. And these kids can't walk two feet. <laughs> Pick me up, and they just sit down, you know. <laughs> Arthroscopic surgery... For arthritis is a worthless procedure, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a big study done by the Harvard Medical School. Why did doctors continue to use arthroscopic surgery for arthritis of the knee? $1.5 billion they made in income on that one procedure the year 2001. Osteoporosis strikes both sexes equally. I had to go to Canada to learn this. Osteoporosis strikes both sexes equally. Anybody read that in an American newspaper? No. Big study, 10,000 people, over 3,000 men, over 6,000 women. Men are as likely as women to suffer from osteoporosis, the surprise findings from a five-year Canadian study. The results turn the tables on the belief that women are the prime victims of conditions. Now here's kind of interesting. This study, the results of the study, will almost certainly change the way that medical professionals deal with the unexplained bone fractures in men and the way that education about the condition is handled. Now raise your hand, gentlemen, if you got an email, or a postcard, or a phone call, or a letter, or some kind of communication from your personal medical doctor, your primary care physician, your family doctor saying, Roy, you better come on in, because we just learned that men get osteoporosis at an equal rate with women, and I want to do a bone density test on you. Any of you men get that from your medical doctor? Now, I've given this lecture 300 times a year. I've been in eight countries, and I've never had a single man raise his hand, or a married man either. Never had any man raise his hand. Now, here comes the killer. The guy who's in charge of the Department of Rheumatology, you know, the, the bone disease guy from McMaster's University, which is like their Harvard Medical School, we didn't think that men got fractures. And now this is what he's teaching to medical students. You want to slap that guy? <laughs> and he's teaching that to medical doctors, that men don't get fractures. Disregard them. They're all gnarled up with dowager's hump. They can't even pick up a glass of water. Well, you're okay. You're a man. You don't get osteoporosis and arthritis. Carbonated drinks. Ten years before this, in 1990, the Harvard Nurses Health Study looked at 90,000 nurses over a 10-year period, and they looked at these adult nurses from between the ages of 35 and 70, and they discovered that those drinking non-cola carbonated drinks had an increased risk of fractures and osteoporosis over those who just drank water and tea by 300%. The ones who drank cola carbonated drinks increased their risk of fractures and osteoporosis over those who just drinking water or tea by 500%. So they wanted to see if this happened in girls. They're thinking that it's a women's disease, right? And so they went to Boston. They got to 460 young girls in the 9th and 10th grade, and they did a little study on them, and they found out that the girls who drank carbonated drinks were three times more likely to get fractures and osteoporosis. I remember we're talking about junior high school girls. They have a 300% increase in risk of getting osteoporosis and arthritis and fractures over girls who drink water and tea. Now, why would you let your kids drink that stuff? I want to end up with that reminder that if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to us. Just don't expect everybody to believe us. And so we can only save them that will be saved. And so we have to keep talking. We have to keep sharing the message. That's what this is all about. And if we do this, you will be rewarded beyond your wildest dreams because we are going to be the Home Depot of health care in the next decade. Hua! 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 Information and statements regarding dietary supplements discussed have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.